Welcome to the first episode of a new video series, Discovery, with the Southwest German Chamber Orchestra. My name is Douglas Bostock. Today, we're going to be looking at Benjamin Britten's simple symphony, Opus 4, for string quartet or string orchestra. And today, we will be playing the version for string orchestra. In December 1933, Benjamin Britten, who was at that time in his last semester as a student at the Royal College of Music, went back to his parents' home in Lowestoft on the coast of the west of England for his Christmas holidays. During these holidays, he spent some time rummaging through his youthful compositions, those which he'd written between the ages of nine and 12. In those early compositions, some for piano, some of them songs for voice and piano, he discovered some melodies which he found attractive and decided to rework them into a new composition. This composition turned out to be the simple symphony which we're going to play today. This work is by way of a greeting to his youth, also a farewell to his youth maybe, and also a thanks to those people who helped him along the way. The piece was finished just a few months later in February of 1934 and first performed in Norwich, conducted by the young Briton himself. The piece is dedicated to his childhood viola teacher, Audrey Alston, and it has four movements. There are two melodies from his youth in each of the four movements. The titles of each movement are alliterated, meaning that each has two words and each word begins with the same letter. Even the symphony itself, simple symphony. The first movement is a boisterous bourree. The second movement, a playful pizzicato. The third movement is a sentimental saraband. And the fourth movement, a frolicsome Finale. So let's now have a look at the work movement for movement. The first movement is a boisterous bourre, the first of the alliterated titles with two Bs. Boisterous, meaning lively, energetic, bourre. A bourre is an old French dance, usually quite fast, but characterized by an upbeat, pom pom, pom pom. And at the beginning of the movement, all of the strings play together in forte, so quite loudly, a kind of fanfare, which actually demonstrates this upbeat character of the bourre and also anticipates the first theme that's going to come a little bit later. The key is a very clear D minor. <laughs> The main theme is from a youthful piano sonata. It has a bourree's typical upbeat character. And in the simple symphony, it's played first by the cellos and then by the first violins. Britain embellishes this theme with skittish little figures in the other instruments and the melodies are passed between the groups almost like a conversation. So let's hear the melody now as it is in the final form. The theme and its accompanying figure are then passed around the instruments in a truly boisterous manner. The second theme is in F major, and it was taken from a song which Britain wrote as a boy, a kind of country dance with the title, Now the King is Home Again. 
at the beginning, the first violins seem somewhat reticent and suddenly stop. But then they gain confidence and sing out the lovely melody which shifts from F major to D major and then back again. Benjamin Britten develops and plays with the first theme and the little accompanying phrase for a while until suddenly a scale in the long notes appears. It passes through all the instruments, but it begins with the violas and the cellos. This way of composing on a ground bass is a little reminiscent of the finale of Mozart's Jupiter Symphony. Let's hear that again now with the other melodies on the top. The music builds up to a high point of tension and we reach a kind of reprise, but not in D minor, this time in D major. Now, where have we heard this before? Yes, it's the opening of the piece with that fanfare theme again, but this time it's going to be combined with the second theme. music gradually winds down and we hear a brief reminiscence of the beginning of the movement when the first theme was heard for the very first time with its little answering phrase but back in the minor key now. The movement ends quietly with the fanfares of the opening but now so hushed and vanishing almost magically.
And so to the second movement, playful pizzicato. Again, the alliteration with two Ps this time. Pizzicato means that the strings are plucked. All of the players have now put their bows down for the whole movement. It's in F major and is to be played, according to the instructions of Britain, presto possibile, as fast as possible. The first theme is from a scherzo for piano, which Britain wrote as a boy, and of course scherzo means musical joke. At first it's played in a little dialogue between the second violins and the violas. We're going to play it now slowly, so it's more easy to understand the theme. This is then answered by the first violins and cellos, but in D minor. We've got this F, D juxtaposition that we had in the first movement. So we're now here from the beginning, still slowly, the first pair and then the second pair. Let's hear now from the beginning with all the instruments in the real tempo, presto possibile. The central section of this movement is called Trio and it's based on a song which Britain wrote as a boy. The song uses words by Rudyard Kipling from The Jungle Book. It is in fact the road song of the monkeys with the following text. Here we go in flung festoon, halfway up to the jealous moon. It starts with chords played by only the violas, cellos and bass, almost like strumming a guitar, and it represents the marching monkeys. Here is the theme very slowly, with the words added. Here we go in a flung festoon, halfway up to the jealous moon. After the trio, the first part, the scherzo, is played again, and then leads to a final section, a so-called coda, where we hear a reference to the monkey music again. Thank you. 
The title of the third movement employs the alliteration of two S's, sentimental saraband. A saraband is another old French dance, but this time it's in three and rather slower and stately in character, often employing a dotted rhythm across the second beat, one, two, and three. Now we will play with all the instruments from the beginning. The melody, as we've heard, begins in the first violins and then moves across to the second violins and violas. And during this melody, the cellos and basses always play the same note, constant, a G. This gives, if you like, a solid foundation to the saraband. Now we come to the second theme of this movement, which is taken from an early waltz for piano, which Britton wrote as a boy. The theme is first heard in the middle of the orchestra, played by violas and cellos, and the waltz accompaniment is on the first beat, a pizzicato double bass, and the second and third beat, gently in the first violins. The first theme returns, but now played more forcefully by the whole orchestra, and the music becomes increasingly dramatic, leading to this passage, which almost sounds angry. <laughs> A few bars later, the music calms down again and the waltz theme returns, but as if in a dream. Britain requires that the players put little mutes on their instruments. It's called con sordino. This stops the strings from resonating so much and produces a very hushed, beautiful, gentle sound as you will hear now. There follow several bars of the greatest beauty, still consordino, and Britain marks these bars to be played teneramente, meaning with the greatest gentleness. The players play three notes with the bow moving in the same direction, creating a most delectable sound, hushed, and very gentle. We hear the music as if through a meshed veil on a hot, airless summer's day.
A last glimpse of the waltz and the music bids a fond farewell, finishing with the quietest dynamic that Britain can write, three Ps, pianississimo.
The last movement is in strong contrast to that quiet ending you just heard. In fact, it starts with two Fs, fortissimo. But the two Fs are also the alliteration of the title of the movement, which is frolicsome finale. Frolicsome, of course, meaning playful, ebullient, fun-loving, or jolly. We're back in D minor now, and the first theme, which Britain took from an early piano sonata, is related to the theme of the first movement. We're back with these upbeats, pom pom, pom pom. Let's hear the first theme now, played by the first violins. Before the violins play that theme, there is a little introduction. Britain arrests the attention of the listeners with fanfares, very much as he did at the beginning of the first movement. And there is a hidden message here. The first phrase begins with the note G, the second phrase with the note D, and when the melody comes, which we just heard, we hear the note A and E. G, D, A, E are, of course, the open strings of the violin. So Britain is giving us here if you like a hidden message that this is music for strings. Let's hear the beginning of the last movement. The second theme of this movement is another song from Britain's youth, a lyrical one, first presented by the second violins. Britain then combines both the themes and he revels in his own creativity and ability as a composer. Later on, the music becomes mysterious when he introduces the first theme in the cello and the bass in longer note values, accompanied by pizzicato violins, who are in actual fact playing part of the second theme. Britain continues to work and develop the themes almost in a Beethovenian manner. The music gets more dramatic, builds up, we switch from minor to major, and head toward a helter-skelter finish, più presto, meaning faster, to bring this movement and the whole simple symphony to a rousing finish. <laughs> 